is. So for some women, they don't want to be cold, they don't want to use the cap, whatever the issues are, they it doesn't matter to them to lose their hair. But for other women, it can be a critical aspect that feels like the biggest hurdle to overcome when they're thinking about chemotherapy. Well, I think just being able to give people an option and say, you know, if it really matters to you and you really don't want to lose your hair, you don't have to. And for that person who especially is worried about their privacy or where their hair is really important to them, to be able to say, you know what, don't worry about it, I think we might have an option for you. It's such a fantastic feeling. I wish I could be here with you today, but because I can't, I'm going to record some information about why scalp cooling works, why it's important to our patients, and what kinds of patients might benefit from the use of scalp cooling uh, to preserve hair during chemotherapy. It's actually a really interesting story, and it tells you a little bit about the power of patients uh, and patients communicating about what's important to them. I had a young woman with uh, young kids who was a whole mass of yellow curly hair, and she needed to get four cycles of chemotherapy to treat early stage breast cancer. And she <laughs> said to me with disbelief, you mean I'm gonna end a few weeks after I start and I'm not gonna have hair, it's gonna take a year for it to grow back. This does not sound like a good thing. And you know, what happens to my work and what will my kids think and what's gonna to happen to my life? And she actually went on this whole investigation, came back to me and said, I heard there's this thing called scalp cooling and got us in touch with people who were doing scalp cooling internationally. And it started a whole big interest group and a research program at our center to try and help scalp cooling become mainstream, both by showing that it was effective and safe and by getting that information out there. But of course we had the big challenge of how to get that done. And my colleague, Laura Esterman, who directs our program here at UC the UCSF Breast Care Center, I uh, went to Bethany Hornthal, who have found a donor who was very interested in trying to help us get this work done because you have to have funding to get any kind of study done. And through the Laszlo Tauber Foundation and Bethany's help, we were able to do, conduct a series of two different trials leading to the first FDA clearance of a scalp cooling device. At the end of our trial with our five institutions, we were able to show that most women kept most of their hair. Almost 70% of women treated on the trial with different chemotherapy regimens that didn't include a drug called anthracyclines kept most of their hair and they were very pleased with the results in general, and they tolerated the scalp cooling well in general. And based on the results of that trial, the FDA cleared the DignicAT machine as an acceptable method for cooling the scalp in order to preserve hair in women receiving chemotherapy for breast cancer. One of the biggest issues is, will I lose my hair? It's an interesting thing, it's huge, because it is such an outward expression of illness. So without you ever telling anybody, people know something's going on, something's not right, you must be getting chemotherapy, are you sick, could you be dying? It's a really big issue and affects not just the outside world and your appearance to the outside world, but sometimes your inner circle as well. Many times for women, their young kids are actually quite bothered and worried about that change in appearance and they don't want their mom to even walk around the house without a wig on. And the wigs are hot and uncomfortable and tight and uh, then a hat, a hat is a sure sign that something's going on, you know? Uh, so I, I think that for women it can affect their psychological health in a big way. And you know, sometimes we hear of women who are sort of balancing uh, the benefits of chemotherapy against the evils of losing their hair. And in the metastatic setting where women have incurable cancer, it can be a huge barrier to getting some of our most effective chemotherapy agents. People just don't wanna lose their hair. So scalp cooling has been a, a way of maintaining control during a period of time where women have very little control. They didn't choose to get cancer. Most of the time, there's nothing they could have done to prevent it, uh, but they have to deal with it. And they're offered treatment choices that uh, where the treatment can sometimes, in some situations, play a very big role in helping them to have the best chance of being cured of their cancer or to live longer and to have better quality of life. 
but they can't control what happens to them during that chemotherapy. Using scalp cooling gives them that measure of control and a way of, if it's successful, maintaining their sort of normal appearance to the outside world. So even if you tell people you're getting chemotherapy, you look pretty good. Even if you don't feel good, you look pretty good. And that makes a big difference to women. So one of the questions that uh, people always ask me is how does scalp cooling work? And it's actually a, probably a couple of different ways. Uh, and of course it was trial and error when it started. But if you cool down the hair follicles, their metabolism slows down. So they may be less sensitive to the toxic cell killing effects of chemotherapy. And then the second thing, of course, is a much more simplistic uh, mechanism, which is that by simple cooling of the scalp, you cause vasoconstriction or the blood vessels actually get narrower and you deliver less blood to the hair follicles and therefore less chemotherapy. So it's probably both of those mechanisms together that when you're getting the chemotherapy and you have the highest concentrations, you're delivering the least amount to the hair follicles and the hair follicles are the least sensitive by being less active because of the cooling. So there are different uh, types of ways that you can cool the scalp. Um, the, there's one way where you actually take this uh, material that can be, that's insulated and can be frozen, and it's a flat, um, soft material, and you freeze it uh, to be very cold, and then you shape it to the head, put an insulating cap on top of it, and then uh, that starts the cooling period. Over 20 to 30 minutes, that uh, cap that you shape to your head will actually warm up. And so then you change the cap after 30 minutes. And those are manual methods of scalp cooling. So you rent a whole bunch of caps so that you have enough to get you through all of the pre-cooling, about a half an hour, during the chemotherapy infusion, and then for a couple of hours afterwards. So that's called manual scalp cooling. You need a freezer or dry ice, and you need a cooler to bring in. And you need somebody to change the cap for you. The uh, automated or uh, types of scalp cooling methods uh, include a machine that has a coolant that uh, actually circulates through a cap that looks like a swimming cap. So there's a long tube and then a swimming cap. There, for some of the machine, one type, there's a temperature monitor, several of them in the front and back of the cap, and others have a single temperature monitor. And then you put the cap on the head, and then again, you put an insulating cap on top to keep the temperature at a, a stable temperature that you want to get, you know, keep the cap at a stable temperature that you uh, uh, trying to achieve. That doesn't require any effort on the part of the patient uh, because the device is placed, you leave the device on, uh, and then when you're done, you unhook it and go home. You don't bring anything home with you. So for breast cancer, we use a number of different chemotherapy regimens depending on the type of cancer you have and how much cancer you have. Uh, the regimens that include uh, a class of chemotherapy drugs called taxanes, another chemotherapy called cyclophosphamide, a chemotherapy drug called carboplatin, uh, those kinds of combinations seem to uh, work very well with scalp cooling. So we do keep most of the hair in most women who use those kinds of chemotherapy regimens. The more number of cycles or doses that you get, the higher the dose, the harder it is for scalp cooling to prevent significant hair loss. The other major type of chemotherapy that we use is something uh, called anthracycline-based. And anthracyclines include uh, a couple of different common drugs, doxorubicin and epirubicin. Doxorubicin is used the most in the United States. Anthracyclines cause a lot of hair loss right away. Two weeks after you get the first dose, you really lose a lot of hair. And traditionally, scalp cooling hasn't worked as well for anthracyclines. We've had a number of women who use scalp cooling with, uh, while they were getting anthracycline-based chemotherapy and kept a lot of their hair, some most of their hair. So clearly scalp cooling can be effective, but it's effective in a much smaller percentage of women than non-anthracycline-based chemotherapy regimens. 
There's certainly been a long-standing concern that potentially by using the scalp cooling that you decrease the amount of blood delivered to the scalp and therefore you decrease the amount of chemotherapy delivered to the scalp, that the scalp could then be a reservoir or a protected place where cancer cells could grow and that that could result in incurable cancer. And that's the, if cancer cells grow in the scalp, it's called scalp metastases. But actually we've done a lot of work to show that uh, one, uh, it's incredibly uncommon to have scalp metastases for breast cancer and most solid tumors. Uh, two, it's very rare to have scalp metastases as the only presentation of recurrent cancer. Usually you have cancer other, other places in the body and the scalp metastases come at that time or even later. Uh, and then three, we've looked at women who've used scalp cooling versus those who haven't. And my colleagues around the world have published data showing that there doesn't seem to be any increased risk of scalp metastases and that survival is the same if you use scalp cooling versus you don't use scalp cooling. So it really has made me very secure that scalp cooling is a safe technique and technology to use that doesn't increase the risk of cancer recurring for women with breast cancer. So we have scalp cooling and I think that we've worked hard to bring scalp cooling into the mainstream where it most definitely is now and we have more data coming out in the near future. It's a really exciting time where women can make that choice in most centers to keep their hair, but it costs money. And that's been a big issue. You know, we, we always look to insurance companies to uh, cover the cost of uh, the drugs we receive, the chemotherapy treatment, the surgery, the imaging, the x-rays we get. But for supportive care, it can be harder. And for hair loss, uh, which isn't a part of surviving breast cancer, but makes it a whole lot easier, insurance companies haven't yet kicked in to cover or to offset the cost of scalp cooling. So for some women, that cost can be out of reach. Now, or the way scalp cooling is generally billed is you either rent the caps when you use the manual method, or you rent time on the machine. So per treatment costs a certain amount. So there's actually an organization now available nationally within the United States that's a philanthropic organization to provide funding for women of low income who can't afford scalp cooling. And so it will offset that cost based on women's need. So by having philanthropic donations over time, we can really improve the reach of this, uh, this great option for women. It's not for everybody, for, for women with, that it's important. We want it to be available for all. So if you're interested in finding out more about this, the organization has a website called Hair to Stay, really easy to remember, we're keeping the hair on. And if you go to Hair to Stay, you can see some of the stories of women who've used scalp cooling, find out how to access uh, this resource or to donate so that other women can access it.